standing by. Welcome to a very chilly Juma Prime with Guillermo Zand. It's about 16 degrees Celsius, which is somewhere around 70, I think, Fahrenheit. So we are up on the main access road, seeing if those Salalas, well, for those who don't know who the Salalas are, it's a pride of lions. Might have possibly followed that herd of buffalo back. And uh, me being a nana, forgot my gloves, forgot my warm hat, but I'll, I'll survive. But it is a beautiful morning it's going to be absolutely stunning shortly the sun is going to rise over my shoulder there's a little bit of cloud around but it should be no problem my name is brent Leo smith i have genre the ninja you can see him on camera and uh, of course there's uh, commander bond or james henry and dangerous dave on the other vehicle and we have louise and kirsten in final control Hopefully, the silence is going to be broken by stampeding buffalo. So let's go have a look. And the one joy about a spot spotlight in the winter is not only does it illuminate what we're looking at, it gives us like a hand heater. Hold it like this. So far, hello, boys. Some early morning sparring. So the rut's going on quite late this year, and that's, of course, a because of the, the, the lack of rain, the lack of water. Uh, normally by this time of year, the, the boys have finished fighting over ladies. Watch the stick. No, this isn't too serious. I'm not more faking. But, well, these in parlor pretend to argue James has got something slightly more interesting to show you. Nice time. Starting on you. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this well, slightly ominously skied morning, and what a way to start an ominous morning and with three lionesses. I can't see the extent of them. There's another one there. There are four of them here. They are stalking something through here. We've turned the lights off. It's just become light. There is something through here that these three are stalking, one lying on the ground, seemingly disinterested over there. Don't know who they are, just come across them right now. There's one running now, or jogging slightly, sorry. I'm just going to move slightly forward. I don't know what they're looking at. I haven't seen anything in here. Good morning, my name is James Henry. Dave's on camera, and this is the best possible way to start a slightly gloomy dawn. Other one's up now. So Dave's going to stay on that one, and I will narrate what the others are doing unless they start to move slightly more quickly. Uh, one of them's gone to sleep, as is the want of lions. They've definitely smelt something through here. One standing in exactly the same way that the one you're looking at is standing Damn, just sure. behind. Here she comes, Dave. She's coming past us here. They look to be hunting something. Now they're settling. She's going to say hello to her sister. I don't know. I'm, I don't know who these are. I mean, they could well be just our old pals, the Gahumas. But I don't. Let me get to train some binoculars on them. 
course, the Solalas have been around here, as have that Munger and Breakaway Pride of nine recently. My opponent's got very amberish eyes, but uh, she looks too young for amber eyes. No, she's not. Look, 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 look. Hello, Spiros Papas. I'm going to assume that you're of Greek origin and wonderful to have you with us. You want to know if I turn the light off? That lioness is stalking something now. You want to know if I turn the light off because it scares the animals? No, Spiros, it doesn't scare them. But what it does do is it shines on them, which if these lions are hunting, of course, makes it very obvious to whatever they are hunting. So it's just in order to make sure that I don't affect their hunt and make sure that we don't sort of uh, distract or uh, attract the predator, the prey, to looking at the lions. We don't want to light them up so that their potential meal sees them. It's not easy being a predator out here. It really isn't. And they need the cover of darkness. Go ahead, Brent. I'm just on the game drive, everybody, on the game drive radio. No, not at all. Um, go for it. They're not seriously hunting. I think they have been hunting. Perhaps. They're looking around. I mean, if something comes across their path, they'll have a go. Here comes another one, Dave, uh, to the right. So we've got it, only the four lionesses, as far as I can tell. Yeah, this is the young one with the slightly um, long whiskers underneath. I think this is the Inkahumas. Any ideas from anybody else? Greatly appreciated, but I'm pretty sure that this is our pals, the Inkahumas. Very pregnant, this one. Look at her. Look how heavy her belly is. It's much brighter on your screen than it is in reality here. So although it looked, the lines were pretty obvious to you, just get on this one in front of us here. Don't. She just looked like she was going to pounce on her sister. Janet, you reckon these are the Inkahumas? I do agree with you. I think that was Amber Eyes who was sort of stalking, leading the hunt to start with. So what I was saying there is that although to you they look pretty obvious standing out here, to me, sitting where I am, their colour is just an absolutely perfect blend into this dry grass. And we're going to make sure that Brent stays relatively close by in case they do something like hunt. But I think, unfortunately, as, the, of course, the day starts to grow, so these lions will become less and less active. They're definitely hungry. I heard some zebra alarm calling at about half past five. They were yelling. And I was just, I, I think that they've probably been chasing zebra around here at some stage today. They obviously didn't catch one. Zebra, I've actually not seen an adult zebra kill at Juma. I've no doubt these lions have killed adults ever, but I've never seen an adult one. Yeah, look at this little one chasing sister now. This is playing. <laughs> Maggie, you say you saw those impala rutting with Brent, and you say, does it make them more vulnerable? Very, very much so, Maggie. Lots and lots of dead male impala around this time of year. The leopards, which normally take generally much smaller prey, the female leopards have killed impala rams at will because they just are not concentrating on anything other than sex at the moment, basically. You can see now, 
as we go in towards the winter and the grass turns that golden colour, how perfectly camouflage and how perfect the colour of the lion's pelage is to blend in. And I think the reason that there are no other predators out here this colour is because only the lion is this big and therefore only the lion needs to be able to hide in the long grass. The others tend to use much more in the way of shady cover, whereas a lion can't always do that. Are very, very much larger than their nearest rivals. We can just make a little bit of a move round to the side of them. I'm not going to go around the front. Now, I'm Joey, aka Monkey Man in Australia. Um, you want to know why they're the only cats without spots? Of course, they're born with spots, which is quite interesting. They're born with sort of a dappled, that sort of color coat that they've got, but it's sort of got dappled red spots on it. And therein, I think, lies our answer, along with what I was just saying. They are very big. There are five lionesses here. There are four, unless I've gone mad. There is one behind the bush there, isn't there, Dave? Well, she moved. No, maybe there are only four. I think I've gone mine. I've gone mad, everybody. There's just four. <laughs> That's so cool to see. I love seeing lions play like this. Let me just reverse slightly. So, Joey, they are very big. That means that they're going to hunt in more... Uh, they promise you there are five lionesses here. Sorry, I'm going mad here. There's, there are two there playing. There are two here. And is there not one to stand by, everybody? I thought I heard another one sneeze. I think I've gone mad. <laughs> Let's just look at these ones. You'd think it'd be pretty easy, wouldn't you? Sorry, Joey, let me just quickly complete this. So, spotted cats. Most of the cats out here are spotted. They stalk from cover. They stalk from shade. They're small enough to be able to move in thick bush quietly. Lions are a little bit large for that. They will use cover when they can, but they do have to move across open areas quite a lot. And of course, in the summertime, that's not too much of a problem because often the vegetation and the grass is very long. But in the wintertime, like now, you can see how they start to blend in with the much shorter vegetation. It's just that much more difficult for them to hide in the areas that they hunt. They are savanna hunters. And unlike the leopard, for example, they do not occur in true forest. They only occur, there are five. Sorry, everyone. There are the two there, there are three over here. There are five lionesses here. There we go, there are the other three, all now having a bit of a fight or a play. <laughs> wonderful straight by us only four feet away and this is amber eyes this is the Inkahuma pride and there's the sub adult So we're talking about their colour and we're talking how beautifully they blend in there. And you can see the golden grass behind her matches her almost perfectly until she turns around and we see the black to the back of the ears. And Kathy Ward, you're saying, is there some significance to it? There's almost always some sort of significance to an adaptation that a lioness has. Hello, darling. 
me old friend Amber Eyes. David, if you could uh, desist from letting your stomach growl at the lion as she walks past, that would be wonderful. <laughs> as she came past there and looked up at David, his stomach went, So, Kathy, that black spot at the back of the ears, if you see in very good contrast like a lion does, is very easy to see even in the night time because it breaks the outline. And we think that it is an adaptation to allow them to follow each other when they're hunting in the dark. I think there are a lot of... I think there are a lot of sort of... Um, Adaptations that we ascribe to animals that are perhaps a bit spurious. Uh, one only has to read the hare-brained and uh, oddball theories for why zebras have stripes to realize that people have got too much time to think of... <laughs> Hello, Sandy. You ask a very valid question. We're sitting here in an open Land Rover uh, and David was not more than one foot away from Amber Eyes, the large lioness of this pride. And, Sandy, you say at the lion park, somebody got pulled out of the, the closed car and, I mean, out of a window. What's the difference here? Why don't these lions leap onto us? And when David's stomach growled and threatened that lioness, why didn't she react? Kathy, the big difference is that these animals have no experience of human beings in the same way the lions at the lion park do so they have they know what this thing is they don't see this sort of vehicle as a threat i have no doubt that they see us on the car i don't think that they associate us in the same way that they do though when we're on foot when we're on foot they are very threatened by us and they will normally move away from us sitting in the vehicle here they're slightly wary initially and then they get used to the vehicle very quickly we don't smell like human we smell like uh, brake fluid and oil and petroleum and various other things and of course in Dave's case it's some very fine aftershave. So they don't associate us in the same way that lions from the lion park will which have had experience of humans on foot. They've been handled by human beings especially as young lions and so they lose their natural fear of us. These lions on, if we were to come across them on foot are afraid of us. They see us as the ultimate predator out here. Whereas at the lion park, they've lost that natural fear of human beings. They've normally been raised by human beings. So they don't see human beings as a threat. And that's why a lion park or a petting park or anything like that is inevitably where there's going to be an accident. Now that's not to say we're not careful. So I mean, I watched that lioness very carefully and I mean, I didn't at any stage feel like we were under some sort of threat, but I did. I did watch her very carefully, and the worst thing you can do out here is to become complacent. Uh, elephants, specifically, are not an animal you ever want to become complacent around. Uh, lions, the same, and all the animals out here, the same. Righty, we're going to stay here with these lionesses for a little while. We'll keep you posted as to what's going on. In the meantime, let's go and find out what the highly enthusiastic and irascible Brent Leo Smith is doing. So exciting to have lions off the bat. So now it's my job to find a leopard. So just to let you know, we're heading down towards the southern boundary. We're going to go look for any sign of Queen Karula and the cubs. So fingers crossed. And uh, while we do that, I know James is lounging in luxury with lions at the moment. Unless I find a leopard, I'm sure I'm going to hear no end of it. Had breakfast this morning. So, James said he did have Karula's tracks crossing south. Now, there is a possibility she's made a kill here in the north. And she's come up and down. But while we look for a non-existent leopard, Let's go back to James and some mobile lions. They're moving now, everybody. They're moving towards the Arethusa boundary. I'm not sure if they've seen something. There's one behind us, four in front. 
They may be stalking something, but they have been kind of playing on these cool, misty mornings that often do play. Maybe they're just playing. But there might be something in the thickets here, maybe a kudu. This is ideal kudu country, so we'll walk, we'll keep with them, but we'll stay relatively far behind so as not to disturb what's going on there. They're just chasing each other. That's wonderful. There you go. One, two, three, four, five. Now, Sandy, you say that there are plenty of kudu and impala around, and is there plenty of food for the lions to eat? Absolutely there is. Uh, obviously, the complex relationship between predator and prey and their consequent numbers will always fluctuate. But absolutely, there is plenty for these lions to eat out here. There are inevitably always going to be more prey species than there are predators. I'm just going to check if Tax and all Lex are mobile so that I can keep them informed. Tax or Lex, are you either of you mobile? Copy, thanks, Lex. Sorry, I was just updating uh, Thusa. Uh, yeah, just keep coming on the power lines. We are moving now parallel through the thickets to the west. Having a wonderful time in here. I'd love to move forward, everyone. I obviously can't because there are three vehicles in front of me. Not three vehicles. Uh, those are called lions, not vehicles, aren't they, Dave? Ah, oh, wonderful. One of them is relieving herself. That is, uh, as Brian likes to say, the usual story. Grant Rogers, you say I need to be careful. They might be leading me into an ambush. It's not entirely impossible, but it is a very unlikely, Grant. You see what a brilliant colour they are? See how they just blend into the kind of autumn grass? And as this autumn grass becomes winter grass, so they will become almost invisible. Stalking each other. They just can't let go of that play behavior. Now, Wicked Ange, you want to know if some of them are pregnant and how long the gestation period is. Some of them are unquestionably pregnant, and the gestation period, Wicked Ange, is about 100 days. 110 days, sorry. And 110 days, of course, is just shy of four months. And they should be giving birth, and we were convinced that that lioness that was hanging around at Bivol's Hook Dam with a massively distended belly was going to... Oh, here's something that's died. Look at this. Can you see this at all, Dave? Sorry. Let me just... Let me move a bit. We'll keep an eye on the lions. This is interesting to me, and I'm not going to get out and point out why. I'm just going to stop here, and you can look at it. <laughs> It's interesting to me because I don't think this was killed by lions. I don't think it was killed by a leopard. I don't think it was killed by hyenas or wild dogs. I think this was killed by a cheetah. It is very seldom that anything survives like that with the spinal column intact unless it was killed by a cheetah. And I think a cheetah killed us, but some time back. Isn't that interesting? I'm just going to call Lex. Lex, we're now due north of you. It might be easier to go back a little bit towards the east and then up through the clearing and then head to the west.
that we're probably about, yeah, we're only about 50 meters north of you. So if you can cut a path through there, um, you'll see us. I'm just going to guide them into the sighting, everyone. Ah, what a wonderful morning. It all seems okay when you find lions lying in the stunning inflorescences of Chlorus Roxburghiana. You see that, David? One should say Roxburghiana at least four or five times a day. I feel it. It's good for the soul. Hello, Tim. One second, Tim. Oh, no, I can talk to you straight away. Sorry, just I've just got to get these guys into the sighting, Tim, and then... Just come straight west from there, Lex. Um, Tim, I don't know if lions communicate during a hunt. Absolutely. We think they do. We don't know in what way, though. So, I mean, there is... I think we've got a long way to go before we understand actual animal communication, especially during a hunt. And it seems to be almost random movement, but it sometimes looks coordinated. And if they see a predator, they will just spread out, sort of line by line, and they seem to have a pre-planned coordinated attack. But they do miss a huge number of times. I mean, often they miss. So I, uh, I suspect there's much more communication than we think there is. I'm just going to try and get through here. Legs come in. Where the others have gone, it's getting very, very thick in here now. Can you see them? There they are. Well, there's one. Lex, Lex, do you copy? Go, James. Lex, have you got us visual at all? Uh, yes, I've got it now. Lex, James. Okay, copy. He's in the site somehow. So now they're moving through the bush here, Tim, and would they be would they be communicating? I've got no doubt they would. How is that communication being affected? I really couldn't tell you. Listen, why are we getting through here? And I'm trying to find the rest of the pride. Oh no, hang on, there they are, they're in front. Let's just keep going there. They, I think they're going to cross over the boundary, everyone, and I think that might be the last we see of them. In fact, no, we should be right. I'm just not sure whether this boundary crosses onto Simbambili or onto Arethusa. Okay, while I find out, try and wheedle my way through here, uh, let's just quickly get an update from Brent, and I will see if I can refine these lions. So, Jeanre and I are going at snail's pace down our southern boundary, and I've got my head hung over the side of the vehicle, looking for any sign of Queen Karula. Now, this is one of the funny things about being out here, is that if you've been away for a while, you're not sure, but I, I'm pretty sure that's the drag mark from the kill that yep. she had a few days later, Jean Ray is confirming. And it is fascinating that, so you've got to double check every single track and whatnot, because I haven't been around for a while. It's always good to double check. It's also good to double check our cameramen, make sure they are paying attention. But a very interesting sort of cloud bank is forming. I was expecting this first beautiful morning, right? dark, deep red sunrise, and I get clouds. Anyway, there's always tomorrow morning. And uh, Queen Karula, and these are fresh. <laughs> I know these are fresh. Because <laughs> I was there 
this today. You got the mage on there? Yeah. So there we go. Queen through the traps. Nice fresh ones. Heading straight east down the road. So let's keep our fingers crossed. She cuts into the north and instead of the south. But while we follow on these tracks, let's go back to James, who's got a kitty cat for you. Okay, we're just probably going to get a last view of them going through here, everybody. That is the Triple M break there, the main road that goes from the gate. And they're going to cross, I think, into Simbambili. Let's quickly go around, get a last view. If they go south again, then it's on to Arethusa, but then we're right here at the kind of boundary with Arethusa and Simbambili. We can't go on to Simbambili, we can go on to Arethusa. So if they go south, we'll see them. If they don't, mm, then we can't. I think they're going on to Simbambili, but we've had a wonderful time with them. Hey, sorry, everybody. Now, Aqua, you asked a very valid question. There's a hyena crossing the road up front there. Sorry, you won't see it, Dave. They've just gone across. That's what they're looking at. They are going into Simbambili, I'm afraid. Aqua, I'll get back to you now. Station's now on Triple M, and animals are at junction Simbambili, Arethusa cut line. There's a hyena. Dave, there you can see the hyena. Just crossing in there. It's crossed, it's gone now. There's another one. It's a third hyena. Something's going down there. Look at that. So, Aqua, you say that their territory boundaries seem to be a bit fluid, that they seem to be overlapping, and that is not entirely inaccurate, but it does depend very much on the sort of specifics of the situation. So here we have the, um, the Nkuhuma Pride. This is almost, the, no, they're, they're, this is not really the boundary of their territory, but the Tsalala Pride has come up here, I think, because of upheavals going on where they normally live, which is down south around sort of Marth Marthley and Londolosi and those sorts of areas and they do come up here when they have trouble from male lions and I think that's exactly what's happened. Seems to be some upheaval with the Matimbas and the Majingalan males up top, up down south there. I think that's why the Salalas have come up here. This is in Kuhuma Pride territory. They go all the way into Simbambili, sort of halfway through to the west of Arethusa and then back round into Juma and Tortrud to the east of us and obviously half of Bifasuk to the north. But their boundaries are a little bit more fluid than are the leopards, and that's simply because they are much larger territories. And that's it, I'm afraid, everyone. We can follow them along the cut line a little bit. Thank you. <laughs> so we, this is our, we can't go to the right of this road, everyone. Um, Sandy in Missouri, before they disappear, you want to know there's a hierarchy at a kill. The hierarchy is defined purely by the size. The bigger you are as a lion, the more you are going to eat. So there's no distinct hierarchy like there is so much in a, in a hyena clan where the most dominant female will eat far more than the rest, but that there is an established actual hierarchy that is enforced with violence. Here, the hierarchy is not so defined. It's just purely the amount of size that we have, that you have. Yep, that's it, everyone. I don't think we're going to get a better view than that. I'll move slightly forward. And, yeah. Davey, I think that's going to be it. You got it there.
Just let me update the Arethusa guys. Stations animals are now in the block north of the Simbambili cut line, about 50 meters north of the cut line and 50 meters to the west of the triple limb break. One now mobile northwest. I can't follow them from here. There they go. We're just going to let them wander in there, I'm afraid. I think they've seen something in there. They definitely, on a morning like this, everybody, with the light that is a dim and the clouds that are sort of scudding over the top of us, a bit of a breeze blowing, they're going to think about hunting for much longer than they would on the normal beautiful sunny mornings that we have. Now we were asked, we were chatting Tim about whether they communicate or not. You see there how one of them has fanned out to the left, one has gone straight through, the other two are looking. Now is that purely just random or is there some kind of concept? They're chasing, they're chasing something. Chasing something this way. Gave something a fright. I can't see them here. There, 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 there. Look. You see them there, Dave? Yeah, there they are. I just heard. Tick -a -tick -a -tick -a -tick. Something's through here that was running. Something can... I think it's probably a buffalo. That was exciting. Maybe a kudu. Whatever it was has got away. Tremendously difficult for lions to hunt, everybody. Especially kind of this time of the day when the light is now bright, obviously. All right, everyone, that's going to be it for this sighting, I'm afraid. So we're going to turn around and head back out. Uh, we might head down towards the south of the reserve now and see if we can't pick up on Karula's track, see if she's coming back this way. Otherwise, we'll head towards Cheetah Plains. See if the cheetahs are taking advantage of this sort of slightly gloomy dawn. That was very, very special. Right, in the meantime, let's go across to Brenty and get an update from him, see what he's doing, and I'll make my way out of here. Oh, Brent has no signal. Sorry about that. You're going to have to stay with me. I'm just going to quickly update everybody. Stations did lose sight of these of this Pride Mobile Northwest from that little drainage line to the west of the Simbambili. Um, from parallel rows and some mobility cut line. I'm leaving the sighting. Right, well, that was marvelous. So, just this morning, when I was doing the, the car checks, uh, which is a particularly um, boring time of the day, of course, because one has to check the oil and that sort of thing, but it's a good time of the day because there's no noise. And that means that you have time to listen. And there were zebra alarm calling, I thought, exactly where we eventually found those lions. And they obviously didn't catch one, but I'm sure that they were irritating the lion. There they are. We're just going to have one more look there. And then we are going to have to move out of the sighting. Just a quick look. There they are. Our favorite lioness is the Nkahuma Pride. <laughs> so, also, the other thing I wanted to quickly tell you, I didn't, and I, I meant to do it while we were there, I don't know if you remember, but where we stopped, and then they walked off into the bush and I couldn't see them again, and then I had to reverse, just where that, that very pretty grass was. There was a tree in front of us, that a very scraggly tree, and we could have just gone straight over the top of it. 
but it was one of those brown ivory trees, and they are named after the brown ivory in Kahuma, and they're very slow-growing, very rare trees, and that's why I didn't, I didn't go for it. I wanted to make it survive. All right, last view of them. No, that's it. Let's go across to Brent. He's got some fresh tracks. So, unfortunately, Karula disappeared to the south, but we have male lion tracks uh, heading down the southern boundary. We also have something that we really wish the cameraman would use more often, although this is empty, so I can't give it to them. This one actually looks like it's been chewed on by a hyena, even. So I'm sure this has just accidentally fallen uh, someone's vehicle. Here we go, Jean-Dre. Sanex for washing hair and other things. Ugh. Oh, there we go. There we go. Well, we don't like to leave rubbish in the bush. And I'm sure it's not been put there. It's just absolutely... Oh, there's my ears. Hey, mate. So we've got a lioness track heading there, and we've got a male lion track heading here. So, who knows who it could be? My guess would be the sticks. There we go. So, we have a look there. There's the lioness track. And come to this side. And there's a male lion track. So, we're going to keep tracking. Boy, it looks like a so while we keep looking for the lines, let's hello everybody sorry i'm losing my communications with the fc but we are here <clears throat> uh, we're driving now down, down towards the south where we're hopefully going to try and pick up some tracks of Karula. I'm not sure where Brent is. Maybe FC can tell us where Brent is. Nope. And we know that um, she was, I mean, Jigger, of course. There's a huge flock of red buffalo weavers. There they are, Dave, in that tree there. And of course, we had the very sad time with Buffy, the juvenile red billed buffalo weaver who rescue was rescued by sam and then met his end you can hear them all around us calling but they're quite difficult to spot there we go they are black of course in some very deep shade anyway that's the red billed buffalo weaver david is that on your particular bird list Not yet. Oh. Oh, there we go. What do we put your bird list on now? Eight. Eighteen. Eighteen. We should be able to get to 30 by the end of today. Sorry. I missed it, Louise. You'll have to give it to me while we're, while we're static. There were some southern grey hornbills in that tree. Hello, Margaret. You just want to know what kind of kill it was that we found. I found, I'm pretty sure it was an impala. Have you got the southern grey hornbill there? You do? Oh. Okay, so Margaret, I think it was an impala. What was that? I am going to have to nip home, I think, at some stage and get another ear piece. This one is a disaster. Nina, very nice question from you about why it is that the hyenas didn't eat the remaining bones there. Nina, I don't know, to be sure, but I can only think that they didn't smell them. 
Uh, I think that that kill is probably about... Oof, I don't know. I mean, he's pretty old now. It's probably about two or three weeks old. And I can only think that the cheetah managed to eat it unmolested for quite some time before, you know, sort of before it managed to rot. And then I suspect the vultures got in there quickly and finished the rest of it off and then left it. Uh, there's still a little bit there for some hyenas to eat, but I suspect because it was consumed before it started to really stink, the hyenas didn't find it. Now, it's interesting, a little while back we came into this area and we had, in fact, that was a, it was well over two months ago, I think it was before I went on leave last time, we had a huge number of vultures just around there and we drove around there, I walked around trying to find something and didn't find any sign of what had died. I wonder if it wasn't that. It might actually be that old. And I suspect then that if there had been a cheetah or something like that on the kill, well, obviously I wouldn't have seen it on foot. It would have disappeared and scarped much quicker than I could have found it. But I didn't find that kill. And maybe that's precisely what it was. You know, the cheetah kills it, eats away from the back first, looks around, checks, can't believe it's luck, keeps eating looks around, still can't believe it's luck, and it sits there for a day or two and consumes that young impala. And while it's doing it, the vultures circle and wheel. Or it's probably in some shade, actually. And while it's eating, it's watching the sky because it'll be nervous of vultures. And of course, vultures will attract lions and hyenas. Vultures will follow lions and hyenas. And so while it's eating under the bushes, it'll be watching to see. And then maybe as it sort of finished the kill, the vultures spotted it, came down in great numbers. And before the lions could get there, the cheetah had scarped, the vultures finished off what was left. And that was it. Maybe there weren't any lions around the area. But it's unusual in this kind of area to find a carcass like that. It's not unusual in, say, the Kalahari, where animals are much more sp spread apart where a cheetah can eat sort of semi-unmolested by the likes of lions and leopards and hyenas. Where unlike here, normally with those bones, you just don't find an intact carcass like that at all. Mm. Katie, you ask a very good question about old age. As I'm approaching my fifth decade. Um, Katie, so does anything get to die of old age out here? Very few things. I think more than we think. Something moving through here. I think it's a diker. I'll get back to you now, Katie. I think it's a little darker. Last time I thought I saw a diker, it was a serval, so we'll just keep an eye out here. Oh, someone dug a hole in the road, Dave. Um, Katie, while we look through here, I'm 99% sure it was a diker. Elephants will die of old age very regularly. They, that is probably their, there it is, it's probably their leading cause of death. I think. Yeah, I'll see. You see it there. There it is, running off. Dikers, however, Katie, do not die of old age. Most of them, as soon as they are vaguely decrepit, get savaged by something out here, be it a wild dog, a hyena, a leopard or a lion, maybe even a cheetah. I think also, though, that buffalo probably die of old age every so often, although most of them, once they become decrepit, will be eaten by lions or hyenas. But what is interesting is that if you go to a place like East Africa, in that great migration of wildebeest, two million of them, far more of them die of so-called natural causes than they do by predation. And that means that many of the predators there are actually largely scavenging. They're not actually killing, they're scavenging to a great extent. And when we talk about the evolution of our own species, the human being, of course, the plains of East Africa are a massive uh, sort of um, sink, if you like, of human evolution from our, from our distant past. And scavenging those animals that died of natural causes as they moved across those great plains 
apparently is what provided the food impetus, impetus an unused food niche that uh, we were able to exploit, or not us, but our very ancient ancestors. So that's quite interesting. And out here, I just wonder if the same doesn't apply. So perhaps a lot more that does die of old age than we think it does. Leopards and lions, of course, often die of old age. It's normally a fairly nasty starvation old age. It's not a very dignified one. Uh, they normally just get too old to hunt. They can't maintain their territories. So sometimes they're killed by other predators and sometimes they just go quietly into the night. There was one leopard, of course, at Londolozi called the 3-4 female and she died when she was 17 and she just disappeared one day. We saw her getting older and more and more decrepit and it just seemed to us that she went away to die. No one ever found her body. We know where her last tracks went and I can remember going two or three days after we found, uh, after we thought she was going to die, two or three days after that. Sorry, I'm getting a question here that I cannot copy. No, Louise, I'm afraid that's hopeless. All oh, right, okay, I've got it now. Um, right, so just to finish my train of thought there, which I've now completely forgotten. What was I blethering on about? Yeah. Old age, dignified, three, four female, that's right. And we knew where she was, she was old and we, she hadn't eaten for a long time. And I can remember two days after we'd seen her in one area, we followed her tracks down into the, this gorgeous part of the Sand River, uh, bordering Mala Mala as the river t makes its way south towards the Sabi River in a lovely glade of jackalberries and mahoganies. And that's where her tracks disappeared and they were never found again. Siberia, Zumi, you want to know when the last time we saw a cheetah around this area was? I can't remember, actually, especially not in that particular area. I'm going to go back to camp and get a new earpiece. In the meantime, let's head across to Brent Leo Smith and get an update on his tracking. So we are checking around Twin Dam at the moment. It looks like there's tracks for these two lioness and one male. Where exactly they've gone, now that is the story. Where did you go from here is the question. Oh, and it seems like the elephants have been hard. Hello everyone, back again. Sorry about that. Uh, not sure what's going on with Brent's earpiece. Anyway, we might just have to repeat yourselves if you want to ask me a question. David, have you seen a black-headed Oriole? I haven't. Oh, good. Well, today's your lucky day. It's in this marula tree behind us. You can hear it calling, that lovely liquid call. That's one behind us. There's one in here. I saw it land. Just keep an eye there. They love a marula tree with the black-headed orioles. Oh, David, I think it's flown. Just like all our dreams. Ridiculous thing to say. Okay, on we go. Ah, K 
Katie, if you want to know what my favorite bird is, Katie is a very uninspirational bird, unless you know it very well. And it's a bird, uh, I mean, I've told the story a few times, so I'm sorry if you've heard me say it before. But my favorite bird is the white out here is, it will pretty much any one of the robin species, but the white browed scrub robin is the most common, and I love his call. He goes, But my favorite bird in South Africa is something called a Cape Robin. And the Cape Robin has a very similar call. But what really makes me remember it with such enormous fondness is when I was living in the city, I would always seek some kind of touch of the wilderness, be it as silly as a grass stalk growing through a cracked pavement, which of course in Johannesburg there are many of. But it, there was a robin that used to live in the garden. I used to live in a little garden cottage. And there was a robin that lived in the garden. And he used to sit under the garden tap and sing. And even in the depth of the, or the depths of the Johannesburg winter, that little robin would sit on, outside underneath the garden tap and sing in the mornings. And it just used to give me such a tremendous sense of uh, how the wild is all around us if we look hard enough for it. And so I'll just never forget that. And from then, the Cape Robin became my favorite bird. And they do have a very beautiful call, even without my uh, somewhat over-nostalgic look take on life. Ooh, David, look at this. Look at this eerie Scotch mist blowing in over the plains. ghostly, isn't it, David? And there comes the sun as well. I might have to take a, a world-class picula of this. Mm. Good grief, that is very pretty. David, my, my camera slash telephone is unable to focus on all of this. It's far too complicated. Mine's doing all right. Yours is doing very well, David. Well done. That is really spectacular, everyone. Isn't it lovely? It's very eerie, as Louise says. I can hear her when we stopped not moving. Otherwise, it's pretty difficult. So I think the sun is going to burn this off, actually. I don't think that it's a, it's a, it's a mist, but a, I don't think it's a front. Maybe I'm wrong. This is spectacular. And I don't know if the camera will pick it up, Dave, but look at the, look at the way that mist is moving up through that little valley there, and it's kind of being tinted uh, silver by the sun. Of course, when one, when one presents, one runs out of superlative adjectives to use, and um, I imagine it must start to sound quite ridiculous. Oh, this is going to be a world-class photograph, David. It's definitely going to be on a National Geographic co cover. If only I could make the camera focus. Louise, of course, is, is now slightly teasing me because she says she can't wait to see it. She's a very fine photographer herself, unlike me. David, my stomach just did what yours did. I don't know if you heard that. At least it wasn't threatening a lioness like yours was. All right, we'll take one more look at this and then we'll move on and see what we can, else we can find. I just think this is a magnificent sight. <laughs> My stomach is, is very unhappy about something. Possibly my photography skills. Right, Darby, let's press on. I'm going to have to get me some more lens when I'm on leave, Dave. Not good, then. 
You never have enough lens, really, can you? <laughs> We're going to gently make our way sort of towards the camp in the hopes that Leo Smith manages to find himself some signal. Um, but in the meantime, we'll see what else we can find. We'll head through the valley of a tributary of the Morati drainage. All right, Leo Smith has found some signal for now. Let's go and check him out. I'll probably see you again in about 33 seconds. So, jean Ray and I are busy heading into the mist. We are gorillas, but we're not true gorillas in the mist. And this weather is sitting down, but we've got an interesting report. I've abandoned the lion tracks. And uh, we've heard about fresh male leopard tracks on a cheetah cut line. So we're heading right there. And we've already seen lions, so now it's time to find a leopard. Right, just listening to the game drive radio quickly. Okay. Legs, legs. Legs, I'm going to check uh, Drakensberg from Mamba. I'm not sure uh, what area you're in. Sleeping. He's not spotting. Yeah, nice little breeding herd of elephants. <laughs> so we've got a little boy. There he is. Who walked up and made sure he stood behind the tree, but to just let us know he's very scary and very big. Uh, you can see, honestly, you're very scary. As long as you don't trip. And he's picking up a little acacia there, a little exuvianus, a little flaky thorn. James Richard's talking about tannin defenses in trees. And he's wondering, is this an immediate response? Uh, so as an animal starts feeding on it, does it immediately start releasing uh, tannins? So James, no, it doesn't. So only if, if the trees in the area feel like they are being heavily pressured will it release tannins. So it normally takes a good five to ten minutes before they start doing that. Yes, mister. Oh, he's got... I thought it was a hole for a second, but it's just two little wet spots in his ear. You can see when seeping from the eye rather and also the, the gland there. Now, from the eye, especially in the dry season, you'll start noticing that a bit more with Ellie's uh, from the amount of dust that's around. That's why they have wonderful long eyelashes to protect them. Oh, that little boy smelt something on his way through. Stop for a snack. So 
Uh, moving on to a different Acacia from an Exuvialis to a Knobthorn. And to a Red Thorn. All the Acacias being eaten this morning. You can see those long eyelashes designed to protect an elephant's eyes. Only wants the leaves, none of the bark. And that little bush willow. Well, there's the bottom disappearing, and the rest of the herd are doing the same. So uh, we're going to keep checking. We might catch up with a little bit more of the herd around the corner. Other than that, we're going to try and keep heading towards those fresh leopard tracks. But while we do that, Natasha in Ontario is wondering, can you tell if an elephant's ill by its dung? Not really, Natasha. I mean, you can see when an elephant's got a run, runny stomach, but that doesn't mean it's ill. Sometimes elephants will eat trees like Tumbuti uh, that are noxious to sort of purge the system of, of, of intestinal parasites and things. It's very difficult to tell whether an elephant's sick from, from their dung. See the mist. Now, the sun's already quite high, sitting about there. We're still quite dark and in the, in the mist. Zoe would like to know if I've seen any leopards since I've been back. I have not, Zoe. Uh, hence my excitement following up on these leopard tracks. And uh, I've only been back for... This is my second drive. Hopefully the leopards will decide to reveal themselves to me on uh, this uh, sunrise safari. Oh, I'm just going to listen to the game drive quickly. Confirm that's on you and down. James, James. So I'm just going to ask Final Control to get James to call me urgently um, when he is back. Elephants walked over those leopard tracks. So, well, apparently the leopard was on top of the elephants. I wonder if it was that same herd, but they're not sure where they went from the eastern boundary. So we're going to check now on this road to see if that could possibly, hopefully, come to the north. Could it be Gajima or is it Tingana? So there weren't male leopard tracks from what I heard. James, if you if you mobile again, it's going to be worth your while heading towards CP. Uh, 
apparently there's uh, those two, the two boys have uh, made an appearance. So I'm getting hold of James because he's driving rusty and there's been a report of cheetah on cheetah plans. So I'm trying to get him to head down there as soon as possible. See if you can get them before they possibly move off. So Nate would like to know how big do male leopards get? In this area, Nate, sorry, I thought I saw a leopard track. It's just a baboon track. Um, in this area, Nate, uh, a male leopard is generally around 75 to 80 kilograms. Uh, the biggest male leopard in record ever is just over 100 kilograms. But anything over 90 is an absolute monster. But, for example, Tangana, I would say, is probably between 80 and 85. And the Anderson, who I have only seen once, I would say is over 90 kilograms. And uh, Kojima, I would say, is probably 80-ish kilos. The Lofelt does have particularly large leopards, though. So, with leopards, a lot to do on their size is all to do with where they live. So, as I said, an average-sized leopard for the Lofelt is probably around 80 kilograms for a big male. Now, if we went to the Western Cape, around Cape Town in the Fengos area, a really big male leopard would be about 40 kilograms, so half the weight. And that's all to do with diet. Here we've got lots of impala and dica and things for the leopards to eat. In the Western Cape, they eat a lot of insects and, and rodents and things. So yeah, there's not that the significant biomass, sort of large animal biomass, uh, for the animals to get too big. So they actually stay quite small. And also you'll find desert, animals in the desert also often a lot smaller and uh, bushveld leopards. Sorry guys, I'm just trying to make sure I don't miss a track. drive had yesterday so all the tracks are fresh from last night and the only tracks I see so far are baboons Getting into the area where those male leopard tracks were last seen. No luck thus far. Not too heavy yet, but I'm sure we're going to get some of that heavy mist this year. And it's, it's quite disconcerting because you get these little water droplets that form on your eyelids. But while we are continuing to check for a male leopard, let's go to James, who's got an animal that derives its name from a leopard. There is a giraffe, everybody, and he's not alone. Oh, no, two old boys sitting in the middle of the bush here, probably reminiscing about better times. One old giraffe, and there's a buffalo in front of us as well. And the giraffe was just watching him. There he is over there. And we were talking a little bit earlier about 
old age and animals that go into old age and how many of them actually survive to live to old age, I think these are possibly two of the species that do manage more than, say, impala or dica to make it to old age. Let's just move a little bit forward. And a little bit back, I think the buffalo, well, we're just more likely to see him again. The giraffe, not so much. I don't know about giraffe movements, you know, I, I find it fascinating that sometimes, you know, we can go weeks without seeing them. And I find that really interesting. And I think they are largely nomadic. I think they move very large distances in a fairly random fashion. And I'm pretty sure, I'm not, well, I mean, I'm relatively sure that it's quite similar to the movement of the elephants, where they come into an area they eat a specific species or suite of species of trees that then communicate with each other through their pheromones that they release into the atmosphere. They become totally unpalatable after a while and then they move off and then, you know, to another area, then they come back again. All right, there goes the giraffe, here is the buffalo. We're on our way to Cheetah Plains, everybody. There were two male cheetahs seen there. It is quite possible that we're going to get there. So we're going to go there quite speedily and hand you back over to Brent Leo Smith while we're going. So we're sitting in the mist here and looking for this male leopard. And I've just heard an elephant trumpet aggressively. So I've just switched off to listen quickly. And then you see that mist. Say it was just up ahead here. Now, it becomes very difficult to track uh, any form of predator when their elephants are around, especially if they're big herds around, because they obliterate tracks with their large feet. Hey, Deborah, the armor a chair traveler. Deborah would like to know, does the mist make animals nervous or limit their vision? Uh, I suppose it does limit their vision, but to a very, very small degree. Um, there's no wind or, or rain, so their the hearing's still functional there. Oh, now we're in proper mist there. We do apologize if the, the camera starts misting up. This is really thick, I can actually feel the mist on my face. But it doesn't really affect the animals too much. So this is the area where I was told the leopard tracks were. So far I've only seen the tracks of a single lioness heading into Juma, but I'm Pretty sure those are the same ones that James found. This is actually, it's quite cool. This is a really awesome light. I mean, look at that. Thick mist. Hey, I think you might be picking up on the condensation on the camera lens. I can almost feel the little droplets of water building on my eyelashes. Curious one says, this misty bush is so beautiful. Thank you for sharing. Well, uh, it's our absolute pleasure. 
Uh, the, only, the only negative I have to say is that Jean Ray does look like a gorilla in the mist. Um, being, being a large and dark haired human. So every time I turn around, I get a little fright, but I, I'll survive. But it is, I do love the mist, misty mornings. So far, I can only see buffalo tracks on the road. I don't see any leopard tracks. I'm wondering whether we've been sent on a wild goose chase. And since if we are on a wild goose chase, I think we should probably go to Buffalo's Hook Dam because there might be a goose. And then at least it's not such a wild chase and we might find something at the end of it. James Richard's wondering if I've heard any updates on Invula. There we go. Sorry, John Ray is trying to keep your lens mist free. Uh, I haven't actually, and, and since I've only been back for one drive, this is my second drive, I haven't heard any updates, and James Richard said he misses that old boy. Well, hopefully he decides to appear out of the mist this morning, uh, James, but uh, I'm doubtful. I, haven't, I actually haven't heard. The last I heard, he was actually quite far to the west. Um, west of us, west of Arethusa. But with a male leopard like that, who's become a dispersal male, it's very likely he could, he could pop up anywhere. This is where those elephants were trumpeting earlier, somewhere around here. Big Eddie bull tracks heading down the road. There's still no leopard tracks. I'm just going to chat to the person who pulled them in. Mike, Mike. One more time for good luck. Mike, Mike. Oh, maybe he's crossed back to the east and changed channels. Lex, Lex. Alex, um, I don't shoot a cut line from pipeline to back towards uh, Buffalo's Hook boundary. I don't have any any tracks here. Um, there's only tracks of a, a, a single lioness uh, heading towards Quarry Pan, and then they get walked over by eddies. Thanks. Okay. Come on. Leopard. No road. And no track. But it was worth a try at least. Now this is Kojima's haunt, so that always excites me a little bit to see a leopard that's not a true Sabi Sands leopard. He doesn't lounge in front of the vehicles. It makes you work a little bit harder for your sighting. Why do I call this mist and not fog? She says it's a beautiful city. Well, um, I don't know, Jean Ray, in South Africa, we don't really do the fog word, we do, we do the mist word. Fog comes in off the ocean. Ah, there we go. There we go. Jean Ray is much smarter than I am. He says, fog comes off in off the ocean, and mist is what we're experiencing now. And of course, we're quite far from the ocean, so no chance of fog. Whoa, that was very close. Again. 
These doors are trying to make me fall out. Right, there we go. Fog comes off the ocean. Thank you, Jean-Dre. And the mist is land-based fog. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, so, we are, we are in the mist. So, Tammy and I was wondering, does mist affect the tracks on the road? Uh, not at all, Tammy. There's a... Sometimes you can see a slight dampness, but, but if anything, it actually makes the tracks a little bit easier to see. So it doesn't, doesn't actually affect them at all. Come on, Mr. Gejima. It'd be quite nice to catch up with him. Find him sitting atop a tree with some meat. I mentioned gorillas in the mist, and when are we going to see them? Well, hopefully soon. Uh, Zoe, uh, I have seen a gorillas, uh, but not the ones that live in the mist, uh, which is the highland gorilla or the mountain gorilla. I've seen the western lowland gorilla in Gabon, and. Uh, very interesting, and, and, and strangely enough, I've never seen a gorilla in the mist. I think that's definitely more for the ones that live up in the Vrungu Mountains, uh, on the sort of border of quite a couple of countries, Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo, Uganda, Rwanda. That's where the gorillas in the mist live. Oh, where? Where would I recommend going to see gorillas in the mist? Um, any of those three countries, Eastern Congo, if you're very brave, because it's not exactly the safest spot in the world. And I would probably say Rwanda is, is a very good place, or Uganda. Great places both uh, to see gorillas in the mist. Who knows, maybe one day we'll be doing a live gorilla safari. Ooh, maybe. Who knows where we might end up? No sign of leopard tracks yet, but hopefully, this is leopard. This is. He'll just be lounging next to the bottles of water hole which we are approaching. Oh, mist is getting really thick again. I can really feel it on my eyelashes. I don't know if you can actually see it. I can actually see it between the camera lens and myself. Oh, as beautiful as the mist is. I know for a fact, most cameramen do not like mist. There we go, John Ray. Big emphatic shake of the head. This is very pretty. There we go, He's, he does admit it's pretty, but as a cameraman, it's very irritating. <laughs> he's got to not only clean this lens, he's got to clean his viewfinder lens. Uh, so it does make it quite trying for the cameraman. Slight feeling that we've been sent on a wild goose chase. Because, um, I don't generally miss leopard tracks, and we certainly haven't seen one yet. The only thing I saw was a lioness track. 
Whoops. Barely even see the water. Oh, hello. No gorillas, but an elephant in the mist. And a hippopotami. And the elephant disappears. And there's a hippopotami in the mist. You can barely see it. <laughs> Chandra thinks this is quite funny. But let's have a look at the LEDs, probably a bit easier to see in the mist. Let's move the vehicle. So unfortunately, none of the male leopards we're looking for, but I'll take an elephant over nothing. Ooh, more elephants just appearing out of the wood, out of the mist. Hello, big girl. She looks a bit upset. Just watch her body language. She's not with us. She's upset with something she's facing. It could be that young male elephant we initially saw. Oh, that's exactly what she's upset with. She's chasing that young bull. see from her body language that she was very upset. Oh, there's a <laughs> baby following. There he is, joining mum. So you just see from her body language, she, she was very annoyed with something. And she was annoyed at something that wasn't in our direction, which is always a good thing when it comes to elephants. And we saw that young bull, and then she's just seen him off. She's now destroying the Zizi first, but there's the young bull she chased. He's going to go hide in the mist now. It's, all, it's quite airy looking at it like that. It's, it's very different. Anne Marie says, this mist is so cool, it's almost like a scene out of Jurassic Park. Oh, is he going to go down the hill? I love watching elephants go down hills. Oh, yes, you're, you're, very, you're very big, very scary, and you, you've been severely chastised. Now he's trying to put on a, a, a good display, now that he's got himself a bit of distance from the big female. Ghostly. It's a ghostly elephant coming through the mist. Sorry. Oh, I, I got very confused for a second. I was looking at my monitor and I'm like, what? Because I pushed my monitor to try and clean it. <laughs> I thought I thought I had lost lost picture, but uh, I hadn't. So Andre was just trying to get rid of um, some of the moisture on the lens. Oh, here we go. Here comes the female who just chased him. going to get another chasing. Oh. No, I'm going to decide for a drink rather than a chastising.
relaxing in this big elephant tower in the forest. Gag is wondering, do elephants ever get a runny nose? I suppose it's, it's possible. And they do have quite a lot of mucus in their, in their trunk. But I'm not sure if they get a true runny nose like human beings get. You actually hear that elephant drinking, so I'm going to keep quiet. And just listen. Okay, we have quite a few other elephants around. Somewhere in the mist. Branches breaking. Look at that. There's the little one. <laughs> I love it when they go down hills, they seem to get too much momentum. Nate would like to know, what do you do when you find yourself surrounded by elephants. Well, I switch off and enjoy it, Nat. It's one of those special moments you get to, to, to have. So it all depends, Nat, on, on the individual elephant herd. And you can read their behavior beforehand. So if they're unrelaxed, then I'll just move away before they surround me. But if they're a relaxed herd, I'll just let them stand around the vehicle and I'll enjoy it. That young bull is moving around the edge of the Buffalo water hole. There he is, he's also having a drink. And you can see with that mist around. Such an exquisite sighting. some great screenshots. So 
elephants are not the most only impressive thing that you see in the mist. And sometimes some of the smaller creatures give you the most wonderful views. And the mist is just what you need to bring them up. So let's go have a look at what James has got. Look at that, everybody. We're just here. We've come to Cheetah Plains. We're hoping to try and get into the sighting of the two cheetah. They are, at the moment, fast asleep in the, uh, those big open areas. But, of course, there are many, many dozens of people at the moment viewing them. So we're going to have to stand by for a little while. But there's lots to explore here at Cheetah Plains. And nothing more wonderful than that quite stunning view of spiders sitting with the morning dew and mist caught on their webs. And you can see the little spider in the middle of that web. I've got no idea which orb spider that is, but I've made lots of comment as to how few spiders we've had this year. I think there are a lot more, perhaps, than I thought there were. They're just particularly well hidden. Isn't that amazing? I mean, it's totally invisible almost to the naked eye. Anyway, there are lots of them around here. We're going to move on and get a little bit closer to the cheetah sighting. And while we do that, just enjoy those elephants with the enormously enthusiastic, highly irascible Brent, Leo Smith. So we're still with these Ellie's here at Buffalo's Hook. And wasn't that spider web just spectacular? Oh, I am going to eat. Let's just move forward and splash. long ivory, very even. So she's heading off in the direction where we heard a lot of other elephants while we've been sitting here. I think there might be some more there. And that is the general area where the leopard tracks were supposed to be. James Richard's wondering, are certain animals better adapted to seeing in the mist? Will it help or hinder certain species? Uh, it doesn't really help or hinder anyone. Uh, I mean, although it might look very thick, this type of mist isn't that thick. I mean, you can still see a good 100 feet. So this, this type of mist isn't really going to help or hinder anyone. Here we go. female had a drink. Now it's baby's turn. Here we go. Stopping for a quick schnozzle with mom. a peaceful moment, a young elephant sucking.
So we're going to go continue to see if we can find these leopard tracks. But while we do that, and leave you with one last peaceful glimpse of a female elephant sucking her young, let's go see what Commander Bond is up to. Hello, everybody. We're still waiting to try and get into the cheetah sighting. I'm afraid the radios are just simply not functioning in a way that will make this very easy. But we are going to do our best. I don't think we're too far from them, but I think there is still quite a few... There still are quite a few people trying to get in there. There were some birds that I was hoping David might be able to super zoom on the top of this tree. David, do you see any birds I there? Not. I think they have flown away. But you know what I think they were, David, and I don't think they're on your list. I think they were yellow-throated petronias. Yellow-throated petronias? Yes. You can't have it because you haven't seen it. So I'm afraid your bird list remains at poultry 20 at this stage. Right? Yes. <clears throat> we found him a black-headed oriole, everybody, on our way to Cheetah Plains. It flew across the road in front of us, so I allowed David to have it. I know that you didn't see it with him, and I'm sorry about that. Hopefully we'll get it up. I think it should be our goal while we wait to see these cheetah to get David's bird list up to 30. Here is a really nice example of the long-tailed cassia. Very characteristic of cheetah planes for some reason. So there is no question that there is... The, sorry, the radio is going to be a little bit distracting everyone. Simply because... This is the only way that I'm able to hear what's going on. That long-tailed cast is the Shambok pod, or that very long podded tree there. And we were trying to find some examples of it the other day to film. I'm still not really sure what we were doing that for, but um, I just couldn't resist climbing it. So we're just listening to the radio, seeing what the status is there. We'll see what happens. Hello, Notebook Girl. Um, that's a very nice name, Notebook Girl. It sounds very sort of... Uh, Literary and slightly nostalgic. David, if you just point your camera over there, um, you just see the same sort of thing where the mist has been caught by the grasses and the spider webs, and the number of tiny little spider webs there is just astounding. So, everyone, at least Notebook Girl, you say, What is my favorite thing that I've ever seen on safari? It's impossible to say. There are so many things, and the reason I stopped here, of course, was because if you look at something like that, every there's just so there is this is a treasure trove of little gems, of wonderful, exciting things to see. Some of them very subtle, some of them very brutal, but all of them equally magnificent. And you can see there are hundreds and hundreds of tiny little spiders, from tent web spiders like those ones you're looking at now to the orb spiders, to the jumping spiders, and we just don't even see them, you know, because the mist doesn't come up like it does today very often and catch the little, or the very cleverly hidden webs of all these millions of spiders. Mm -hmm. It's just brilliant. All righty, on we go. We're getting slightly closer because I can tell the radio comms are getting slightly better with that sighting. But I'm not, still not sure exactly what's going on. But hopefully we'll be lucky. Yeah, so it does, doesn't it? I mean, you say it looks like we were an entirely different part of Africa with all of the thick mist having just disappeared. It disappeared within, what, day about three seconds? Yeah. We were sitting with those uh, spider webs that you saw when you were looking with the elephant with, with Brent, and you came quickly across to look at those big orb web nests, 
And as you crossed away, it, we looked up and the mist was gone. But if you look in front of us there, you can see that it is still sort of moving gently. You can see that grayness on the horizon. And that is that same cloud that came bungling through here earlier. And I think it's, well, there's more mist, further mist as we go sort of towards the valleys of those clearings. Let's see what else we can, oh, I, I'm sorry, I'm just, I have to keep doing this. I can't stop myself. Check this one out. <laughs> How's that? I mean, look at that. Look at it. I just think that's too wonderful. And you don't see these without the mist, this mist. And Dave, if you go up and to the left, there's a tiny, there's an even smaller one. So that's about two inches across, everyone. And then behind it, you can see an even smaller one that's probably about an inch across. Every little branch is strung with silk. Tiny, tiny, tiny things that you would never normally see at all. That's probably about half an inch across. Look, there's the little spider. You can see her sitting there in the middle of her web. Very cross today, of course, because everything can see her web. That is tiny, everyone. That is, that's, I'm just trying to see which one Dave's looking at. I can see it. It's an inch across. From top to bottom there is an inch. which must make each of those little strands or what do they call them? The ones that go around the outside? I can't believe that I don't remember that. Anyway, they are less than a millimeter from each other. And there's an even smaller one. <laughs> Look at that. Look at all the dew caught or the mist caught in that web. I just think this is too magnificent for words. He was. <laughs> right, Brent Leo Smith is back with even more elephants. While we enjoy the spider's webs and try and figure out what's going on with the cheetah sighting, let's head back across to him. So. We heard these elephants while we're sitting at Buffalo Hook, now we've moved here, and we are completely surrounded by a massive herd of ellies. And fortunately, there's this female with a tiny little baby, a couple of months old, sitting next to us. And that female, they look at the little one. And Look at that. Tiny, tiny. The mist is lifting a little bit. The sun is burning it off. And the big female there is eating what a lot of people call elephant lollipops. So you'll often find fields of round leaf teak that are kept at that exact height by the elephants feeding off them. So you have massive stumps and these tiny little trees coming out and that's all the elephants farming the round leaf tea. A little one. Yes. There we go. <laughs> Look at the massive size difference between mom and the baby. one exploring with its trunk. Not quite adept at using it yet. And this is incredible. Even on the tiny ellies, if you look at their ears, 
you can see that massive network of capillaries behind their ears that help to cool them down. Um, moving on to the next round leaf teak tree. A little one playing in the very now very dry mud. Practicing picking up things. Looks like it's got a bit of soil. <laughs> Could be some minerals in the soil that it, it, it feels it might be lacking. lacking. So some salt or iron. So picking up little bits of mud and chewing on them. Or could just be practicing to get its head around its big nose. <laughs> Isn't that just too cute? Can't quite master the art of picking things up yet. Oh, there we go. Let's go for something smaller. I can get that in my mouth. <laughs> well, if the trunk fails, get onto your knees and use your mouth. Ellen in North Dakota is wondering about the miscreant young elephants. So the miscreant elephants are generally between about 14 and 20 years old. And Ellen's wondering, do they act out because they're missing the mom group? Uh, I don't think they're missing the mom group, Ellen. I think it's more... Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> I snorted that by a little female. <laughs> yes, you're very scary. That is a very ridiculous trumpet you have. It's eat, eat your leaf. So, Ellen, I don't think they're missing the mom, mom group as much as the fact that they've got so many hormones rushing around through their body. Uh, so it's more uh, the testosterone and adolescence that causes them to, to, to act out rather than the missing of the mom group. We're just going to move forward. It's literally, when I say there's elephants everywhere, there are elephants everywhere. See there, and on my right, big grey bottoms. Let's try and see where it's going to be our best view. Well, there's a nice little group. So, Shannon. Hi, Shannon. Shannon's in Ohio. And Shannon's wondering, how soon does an elephant have the next baby after it's got a little one? Does it wean the first one first? It most definitely does, Shannon. So, generally, an elephant will wait until the other is young, sort of five or six years old, and definitely on the way uh, to being an adult before they'll even consider mating again. Oh dear, Jean-Dre is going to... Um, Jean-Dre is going to hate me. I'm going to wait. Hopefully, the, the creature I'm looking at lands before... Make Sean Ray try to find it. Oh, he's oh, trying to find it. Uh -uh. Oh, it's that way. Oh, oh it's going to land. Watch your head, watch your head. Now, that is a, a, a stalk-eyed 
fly. It's, mm. it's gone. It's in front of the car. So it looks, it looks like a wasp, but it's not. It's actually a stalk-eyed fly. Uh, so it mimics a, a venomous creature like a wasp, even though it is just a type of fly. And you quite often find stalk-eyed flies around elephant dung. Unfortunately, you can't see his stalks because <laughs> he is moving quite quickly. Well done, jean -Dre. I'm going to pay for that breakfast, though. <laughs> jean, -Dre, jean -Dre is not going to be happy with me. But uh, so they've actually got sort of eyes that stick out the side of their heads and they're very yellow eyes. And uh, you quite often find them around elephants. Oh, look, hello. That massive herd, I mean, just from what I can see in a quick glance around, there's at least 20, 25, and I can hear a whole bunch more around us. So we didn't get the best view of that stalk-eyed fly. Let's see if I can find a picture. So Angel Lady would like to know how tall was that little guy he was picking up the mud. Oh, I don't know, probably a meter at the shoulder, not, maybe not even. There's elephants all around us. I think a stalk eyed flies are very cool. Um, and just from the brief view, I had I would say it was number three. So it doesn't have a, an English name, but you can see why they're called the stalk eyed fly. So those are the eyes on the end of those stalks. So this particular one I've seen around elephants quite often, and it's specifically around their dung. So the other stalk eyed flies form big swarms. These are generally found individually like that, and they are quite big. So, very, very cool looking creature, the stalk eyed fly. There's about nine or ten different species in southern Africa, but only three that we get in this area, and the others are, are quite a bit smaller. Let's move forward again. There's something so peaceful about just sitting with elephants, watching the occasional stalk-eyed fly fly by. She's feeding off a knob thorn. I think the elephants are actually going to do us a massive favor this drought. They're really going to open up the bush and give some of the grass species a chance when we get rain. So nature works in cycles. Uh, the fact that elephants are going to push and, and smash and crash and bash trees and bushes is not a bad thing. So we've had a very wet sort of eight years and that's caused quite a lot of thickets to form and, and, and little trees to grow and it's been great but now I think it's time for some grassland.
always, always unbelievable to me how dexterous their trunks are. So we're just going to sit here amongst the elephants and enjoy ourselves. But while we do that, uh, James would like to give you a quick update about how his morning's going. Hello everybody, uh, we're just giving you a quick update on what's going on with the cheetah and the story at the moment is that we can go in there, we're now the first standby, so we'll go in there just now. I just want to give a quick update from Ephraim as to exactly where it is. Hi, Bob. Hey, Bob. Minjan. Yeah. Martin. Oh, okay. All right. So you in got jiggle Martin. Okay, and go home. Okay. So he's just saying that they're in a big open area, the other side of the water. So we'll just go and pop past the water hole here, and we'll have a look there. Welcome back. <laughs> Looks like everything is on track for us uh, going to see them, so that's very good news. They haven't moved too far south, they haven't moved too far north. So we'll go and have a look at the water hole here, and then we'll continue. In the meantime, um, Louise? I'm not sure if I have communications with the final control. Oh, I copy you now, yes, thank you, thank you. Now, oh, David. David, I hear some birds here. I still would like to get you another ten species before we go to the cheetahs. I don't quite like that, James. Mm. What we're listening to there, everybody, is the white-browed scrub robin. But we can't give it to David unless he's seen it, you see. And they're so seldom seen. We were chatting earlier about robins and their wonderful calls and the fact that they are definitely my favourite group of birds. No, David. Come on, let's go ahead. There's some water up ahead here. Have you seen the three-banded plover yet, David? Right. Three-banded plover coming up. You should, in theory, be able to get a bird list roughly of around 240 in this area if you're very lucky. But it's not... I mean, up there are parts of the Kruger there are probably there are 500 species of birds that have been seen in the Kruger National Park. And up in the far north around Pafuri, uh, they have a bird list of about 350, if you can believe it. Oh, David, there's a whole suite of birds here. Let's have a look. It's James. James, I'm putting out. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. Sorry about that. We're going to go and see some cheetahs, everybody. That is very exciting. Righty. Now, as far as I know, they just should be through the open area here. Oh, this is wonderful. And I don't think there's anyone behind us, which means we will probably be able to spend an extended period with them. So there's an open area down through here. I think they're just inside there. There's an elephant. Elephant's going to have to wait. You've seen some elephants. Can you see the elephant there, David? It is just eating some leafies. I'm too excited to stop, I'm afraid. There is the elephant, eating quietly under the tree. Oh, and 
there's another one and another one there. All right, in the meantime, we should be right near, near there, I think. But while I get in there, let's go back to Brent. So we're still with the Ellies and they've just started moving now. Just trying to get us into a spot. Hello, oily fans. Sorry, don't get upset with me. Ellie's are moving off. We're going to try to keep with them. That morning Aaron, the man from the land of the long white cloud. I'm surprised you're not watching super rugby at the moment, Aaron. Well, I think it actually starts in a little bit. But um, Aaron would like to know how much do I spend spending time, miss spending time with Ellie's when I'm away? Well, when you see little gorgeous creatures like that one, a lot. Uh, and they definitely do sort of calm me. Elephants, and I'm, I'm a very sort of hyperactive person. And Ellie's do definitely have a huge calming effect, and I, I do miss them. But fortunately, um, even when I'm not at work, normally I do live in the bush, so I, I get to spend a lot of time with wild animals even when I'm not working, which is wonderful. Now we've got the Ellies in their teak farm. As I was saying, they tend to manicure these round leaf teak to the ideal eating height. And you can just see all the little bushes in front of them have been kept that height by elephants. There we go, that's the round leaf teak, Pterocarpus rotundifolia. You can see very round leaves. So Elaine would like to know, since uh, the accident that's causing me to have all these hip issues uh, two years ago, do elephants make me nervous? Not at all, Elaine. It was a, a complete fluke uh, a thing, and it wasn't the elephant's fault. It wasn't my fault. It was just one of those things that happens. But, uh, so, no, Ellie's don't make me nervous at all. But Elaine, we're going to leave the elephants now and uh, go to something I'm sure everyone is very excited to see. And it's a cat of the spotted variety. Look, everybody, it's two cheetah. Now, notebook girl, I believe these are your first ever cheetah. Well, welcome to it. Isn't, aren't they wonderful? Two males, adults, and the only other sort of semi-social cats that there are in the world. They'll be brothers, most likely. And we'll go a little bit closer just now. I just wanted to stop here as a sort of moment of discovery first and get an idea of them. Isn't that great? Oh, that's fantastic. And as I said, Notebook Girl, your first cheetah, which is marvelous. <laughs> Laura, you ask a very valid question all the way from Alabama. You say, do cheetah ever jump on cars here like they do in the Masai Mara? Laura, they don't, you know, they don't have to. Um, they have a lot of cover, and they also can get vantage from the termite mounds. The reason they do it there, I think, is for vantage points. We also don't see them nearly as commonly here, and so they're not quite as habituated to the vehicles as they are over there. Apart from jumping on the cars quite often to get vantage points over the wide plains there, 
they also of course use those vehicles for shade quite a lot now while it might be an advantage for a cheetah to get into the or to jump up onto a car in this particular area because there is a plane here in most parts of this ecosystem it's largely woodland and so for them to jump up on a car is just going to provide them with a slightly higher view of a wall of trees I'm going to move slightly I'm slightly dissatisfied with the position that we're in now These look like very, very fat bellies, everyone. Oh. How's that, David? Don't say I'll never do nothing for you. I hear. Shannon, you want to know what I would do if someone, if one of these cheetah jumped on the car? Well, Shannon, I'd probably squeal like a small child to start with. <laughs> and then I might become quite excited. Um, it would depend on the cheetah's intention. Were the cheetah to find me something sort of delicious to eat, then I imagine I would be totally terrified beyond my wits. But. I think I would just be excited. I have viewed them on foot before. And they are generally very confiding. This is fantastic, isn't it? They are so fat. They've had a very nice meal, clearly. Now let's just reverse and we'll get them in the light. How's that? This is fantastic. They are starting to head south now, towards Mala Mala. Look how tall they are. They're much taller than leopards. Now, while I move, and you want to know how it is you can judge their age. You know, I'm so inexperienced with cheetah, I don't actually know, other than for condition. So, you know, like with lions and leopards, their nose color and their skin condition and all that sort of thing, you can tell. But with these guys, I don't actually know. I don't know how long we're going to be able to be here, just in case they do cross. And I know that there are now one or two others who want to get into the sighting. Davy, isn't that fantastic? And Margaret, you ask a very good question: Do cheetah climb trees in the same way that leopard do? No, they don't. But they do climb a little bit. So if a tree has um, got sort of a slope on it, for example, they can run up that, but they don't have the claws in the same way that a leopard has claws. So for example, Dave, yeah, that tree that this cheetah is going past now. Look, 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 Dave, on the tree there, just sharpening the claws, and marking territory. That is just brilliant. See, spraying, marking territory. Now watch, onto the log, onto the log, Dave. How fantastic is that, everyone? You don't see that every day. And this is the kind of tree that a cheetah will climb. Oh, watch out, buddy. Your brother might just wet your face there by mistake. This is just fantastic, eh? Chaps, you don't see this every day. This really is spectacular. An 
Anna Marie, you say you want to know if there are any others around here because we see these two males quite a lot. Um, Anna Marie, there are. There's. I've seen, we've seen tracks of a female, but this is the sort of dominant coalition of the area. Now, by dominant, I don't mean uh, they're not. By dominant, I don't mean dominant like a male lion gets dominant. They're dominant in so much as there aren't any other male cheetah around the place. But they will move, and these, this territorial marking that they're doing is very much temporary. So they don't often, they won't by deep, they won't sort of mark territory in a permanent way in the same way that a lion will. So it's possible that others might come into this area. But these guys are the territorial males. This is just fantastic. <laughs> look, marking territory now. Don't know which one to look at. An angel lady, you make exactly the correct comment. You say their heads are so tiny. They are tiny. And they're tiny for a very good reason. They're tiny, angel lady, because they are so very specially adapted to not being at least for speed. And that small head is an adaptation for that. It means that the jaw can be slightly smaller. And for the jaw to be smaller, it means that they carry less weight, they can be faster. Isn't this brilliant? Oh, two cheetah walking across the open clearing. So unlike with a leopard, for example, everybody, um, you've got a situation where the leopard's got a huge, it's got a massive head because it's got much bigger jaw muscles, but that does inevitably make it slower. It's unable, the cheetah's completely over-specialized for speed, whereas the leopard is specialized for kind of stalking and that sort of thing. And so you find this very small head with much smaller canines, a much bigger nasal cavity, but it is just simply part of the fact that they, that they are adapted for speed. Curious one, I don't know the answer to your question. You want to know if the, if the scent marking smells still like buttered popcorn. I don't know, curious one, I haven't smelt it. We can go back towards those trees just now and have a whiff, if we like. This is too wonderful. And Zahir, you say you've never seen cheetah marking like that. Well, Zahir, that's not uncommon. It's simply because they just don't do it very often and they don't mark that often because they are temporarily territorial. So in the absence of other predators giving them uh, trouble, they will be territorial. But if other predators give them trouble, if there's too much lion pressure, if there's too much leopard pressure or hyena pressure, then you'll find that these cheetah will not mark. Sorry, I'm just going to stop here for a second. I think this might be the best spot. Oh, I think there's a, there's a termite mound there. Dave, let's go and head around there. I think they're going to go onto the termite mound. Tammy, you want to know if cheetah are anything like house cats? Now that might seem like an odd question, but they actually are. Not entirely unlike house cats in that they purr, which is very unusual, of course, for a big cat. And they will domesticate. They actually domesticate quite nicely. Just like a house cat will domesticate. And Genghis Khan, of course, famously had a stable of cheetah at one stage that he used as hunting dogs, if you can believe it. Let's move a little bit further forward. Once they cross this road, everyone, that's it, I'm afraid.
And Ergag, you want to know if it scat is as smelly as lion scat. Sorry, I've just got to get out of the way so these guys behind us can have a view. Ergag, I couldn't begin to tell you, I'm afraid. I don't know if they've got smelly scat or not. We'll go back to that tree, though, just now, and we'll actually have a smell of their urine and their scat. Yeah, I'm afraid I think they're going to cross south now. Yep. Oh, that's interesting. Am I right? A bit of misconception. Yeah, I can get on. And you want to know if female cheetah is solitary. And female cheetah are, yes, generally solitary in the same way that leopards are. But they're not quite as defensive over their territories. Like I say, in the absence of pressure from other predators, they tend to be very unterritorial. At least when there is pressure from other predators, they tend to be unterritorial. I just need to find out, everybody, if Mike needs to make his way in here, or where he is. No, in fact, I don't have to, I don't think. That's it, they're going on to Mala Mala. Let's get one last view, we'll try and get sort of round to the front of them. Doesn't like, he doesn't like the look of Dave on the back there, everyone. <laughs> Sorry, Dave, I know the angle's not great. What a treat. What an absolute treat. Yes, and they probably are... Louise makes a good point, Dave. They're probably afraid of your stomach rumbling. I would be too. So that's it, I'm afraid, everyone. What an incredible, incredible treat. I suppose we can follow them while they're in the fire break here. But they seem to be heading largely towards the south. And let's maybe move a little bit further along. Dave, with the super pop zoom, can probably get a look. Now oh, that actually might be okay, Garvey.